Frontiers of Science, a series of information films presented as a public service, documenting the latest developments in medicine and science in the space age. can be found in many places. It can be seen reflected in the eyes of those who are privileged to look at it. Here at this Bell Telephone exhibit, it can be found in the shape and form and made from the metal and the wire the time and the effort of those who are privileged to create it. Now I'd like to show you what our recent development, the transistor, may do for future telephone service. First, I'm going to throw this switch and turn back the clock to the days before you could talk on the telephone over distances of, say, several hundred miles. Now, I want you all to listen in while I talk on this telephone. Well, I don't think any of you could really understand what I was saying, but let's throw another switch. And start coming back to the present. Now you can hear me clearly over a line that represents the same distance. That's because we now use repeater units containing sound amplifying vacuum tubes to give your voice a boost as it goes across country. previously. But look how small this repeater unit is. This smaller, easier to make amplifier was made possible by developing the transistor, a tiny piece of sound amplifying equipment that requires no warm-up time and has an almost indefinite lifespan. Our research people are hard at work finding out what else it may be able to do, where else we may be able to put it to use. This is a business that has always dealt in the future. That's the way Alexander Graham Bell thought of it when the business was started back in 1876. I was in some haste to invent the telephone, but it has urgent work to do. It talks, sings, and makes you laugh. Quite an abundant work. In my view of the future, the novelty will wear off. The instrument will be behind. It will grow light, convenient, and familiar to every hand. A common tool within the means of every factory, business, every home. And connected to a central switching office which can connect any two subscribers in a matter of seconds. And then I see its lines and poles marching thousands of miles. Connecting the head office of every city in the land to the head office of every other city. And then I see, perhaps, in the next century, the tiniest, farthest hamlet woven into the wire fabric. Telephone people must always be looking ahead. It was that way in 1922, when you might have heard this kind of conversation by some engineers who had the job of looking into the future. Say, Charlie. Got a minute? Sure. What's on your mind? Take a look at this chart. What do you make of it? Well, if we keep on adding customers, as we have in the past, and if our customers continue to place more and more calls, with the manual equipment we have in now... We won't be able to give the kind of service our customers expect from us. I'll make you a little bet that never happens. Well, what's the answer? You know... That's a question telephone people have been asking themselves for years now. And finding the answer in a type of telephone service that switched calls automatically. It took the time and energy of many telephone people who made use of what was already known about dial switching systems in developing the new equipment and new techniques which would make this better, faster, automatic service a reality for the people they serve. The future had been met before it ever arrived. 
today, most telephones are dialed. There were problems, sure. Dial is a pretty complicated affair. Ask some of the old timers, they'll tell you. Glad to. I can still remember how we sweated it out together. Drawing circuits for a dial exchange that could be produced not only on a sheet of tracing cloth, but on an assembly line as well. As a production supervisor, I know from experience, it's tough enough to make a change on a production line that's already in business, let alone starting from scratch to set up a new one for something we'd never made before. Out in the field, we installation people have always had the problem of installing the new stuff and cutting it into the line without interfering with any one service. Our customers like to feel they can use their telephone anytime, and making that possible has always been part of our job. That was the problem of finding a new spot for the operators who handled the manual switchboards that preceded dial. What happened to the operators? There are thousands more today than there were before dial. More improvements in telephone service mean more calls to handle. More calls mean more jobs to do, and more people to fill those jobs. We've always felt that in the long run, the best equipment we could provide produce the best results, not only for the people we're in business to serve, but for those who help to make that service possible as well. People like Frank Dubrovnik, cable inspector. Mary Jane Holmes, service representative. Eleanor O'Brien, operator. Luke Benson, field representative. Each of whom, in his own friendly fashion, made that service a reality on an ever-increasing basis. If you have any doubts on that score, ask those of us who pick up our mail at RFD boxes. Since the end of the war, well over a million of us have had telephones installed. The vast spaces of America that represent a living for the farmer present a tremendous problem for anyone with the responsibility of providing telephone service in those places. It used to take a lot of construction work, a lot of telephone poles to bring in a telephone to someone in a rural area. We're still using poles today. Since the end of the war, we put up about two million of them. The difference being, we now use wire that requires one pole for support, whereas three were needed before. How come? Ask the men from our research and manufacturing organizations how come. They're the ones who followed the job from an induction furnace where the test ingot was poured, through the prescribed heat treatment, to the making of the test wire that in time became a red-hot snake of slithering steel racing through a Western Electric wire mill, and eventually turned into the extra strength telephone line that crosses Dave Baker's pasture. New wires, speedy, power-driven augers that burrow out of the earth a place to set a telephone pole, sharp-tongued wire plows that bite into the ground as if they really enjoyed it and lay special rubber-covered wire, as well as a new way of using power lines as telephone pathways, have stretched the long arm of friendly telephone service to many a friendly farmhouse door. Besides serving as a path for telephone wire and acting as a highway for the newest transcontinental airplanes that fly so high they cannot be seen, only heard, the air above the earth serves as a highway for something else that can be heard but not seen. The only visible sign of these conversations is the radio relay tower they come from, through whose lens pass microwave radio beams, carrying not only the telephone messages you speak, but the radio programs you hear, the television shows you see, to the next tower on a hilltop 25 miles away, 
which receives the signal and sends it to the next hilltop tower, and so on until its destination is reached. Another communications highway of the present and the future is to be found in coaxial cable. The basic coaxial cable can handle 1,800 telephone conversations at one time. And that's a lot of telephone service. Not to forget television programs, teletypewriter news services, and radio programs. Coaxial cable like this has already crisscrossed the country, pushed past some of our last frontiers, guided by a 20th century type of pioneer who swapped his covered wagon and team of oxen for a diesel-powered cable plow and left in his wake not a wagon trail, but a network of electronic highways. Another frontier in the everlasting campaign to improve service is to be found in the town of Media, Pennsylvania, not far from Philadelphia. It's Monday morning in media, and Mrs. Douglas of the Hillcrest Avenue Douglases can hardly wait to telephone Philadelphia to order a real bargain she spotted in her Sunday paper. There she goes. It's an out-of-town call, but she dials the number directly without having to reach an operator. One of the most important problems that had to be solved to furnish this service was finding a way of automatically keeping track of how long Mrs. Douglas's conversation lasted, the telephone number she called, and telephone number, so she could be correctly billed. This array of impressive looking equipment in the central office went into action to do just that. It's not enough for the equipment to remember, it's got to make a record as well. Here at this recorder, the billing information from Mrs. Douglas's call and others from media is punched out in code on a reel of tape. At an accounting center in Philadelphia, the information is processed by machines which have had such brains and skill them that they can translate the coded perforations into a record of... Efficient as this equipment is, it's but an early step in the development of an automatic message accounting system. In the laboratories, the men who develop new equipment and the men who will have to build it are always at work, not only improving what has been developed, but creating new things as well. Like the latest crossbar switching system, whose automatic switching of telephone calls has made possible operator toll dialing. However, it's one thing for highly skilled scientists, technicians, to devour equipment in the laboratories, and quite another to mass produce it on a production line. What goes into it? Where do we get it? How much does it cost? What are the conditions under which it must be handled? What tools will be required for its assembly? What production procedures will be followed? What skills will be required by people employed in this operation? What training will they need in addition to their previous experience? Is adequate test equipment available? What rate of production is indicated by the specifications? In this case, as in all cases, the combination of Western Electric working with the Bell Laboratories on crossbar switching equipment from the very beginning made it possible for those questions to be answered before they were ever asked, and paved the way for operator toll dialing, a new technique in telephone service that makes it possible for operators to dial long distance calls directly without going through other operators along the way or at the distant place. That's quite an improvement in long distance service when you consider that in 1927, if you wanted to make a long distance call, you picked up your telephone and then something like this took place. Number please. May I have long distance? One moment please. This is long distance. I want to call Chicago. The number is Wabash, 2098. Thank you. We will call you when ready with Chicago. The long distance operator passed the call on to a line operator, 
who found an available line to Chicago and over it reached an operator at the incoming switchboard for Chicago long distance calls. Chicago? Wabash 2098? The Chicago operator put the call through to the Wabash central office. Wabash 2098? And finally, the operator was able to ring your party. Time required? About five minutes on the average. And in 1927, that was good long-distance service. Today, in many places, with many more on the way, you give your long-distance operator the number, and she calls into action the crossbar dial switching system, which sets in motion the corresponding equipment in Chicago. And the next thing you know, Wabash 2, 2098, is ringing. Time required? About one minute. We've come a long way since 1927 because we wanted to come a long way. What's made it tough has been the complicated equipment necessary to give telephone service. When we develop something new, it's a physical impossibility and financially impractical to rip out everything we have in service one day and replace it with all new equipment the next. Besides, who is to tell this man that his call is not so important, but that it can wait? Or this girl? The country's telephone service can't be turned off while the telephone company changes over to new models. Wherever you go in the Bell system, from the operators at the other end of your line who take pride in the part they play in furnishing your telephone service, to the construction people who see to it that tomorrow's telephone lines are put in today, you will find telephone people building for the future. The future of the telephone business is bright and rich with promise for the millions of telephone users like yourselves, whose quick acceptance and ready use of each improvement in telephone service has helped make possible an endless chain of accomplishments. What will it be this time? An operator dial call to Cleveland? Or the ballet on channel two by means of coaxial cable? An important call by mobile telephone service to a transcontinental truck on US-1? To a ship putting out to sea? Or to a train racing across country? It has been the faith of the American people who have invested their savings in the Bell system in the present, as well as the desire of telephone men and women everywhere to keep on furnishing more and better telephone service in the future that makes this story a story without end.